nine who gets PDK only. This car weighed 22 pounds less than the standard 991 GT3. Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Bids, and today we're talking about something very purple. This is a Porsche 991.1 GT3 RS, and in today's video we're going to be discussing its facts and figures. First, we'll take a general look at the history of the GT3 RS and where it fits into Porsche's past, and then we'll get nerdy and talk about the technical details of this car. So let's get started. Before we get going though, überraschung, überraschung, this GT3 RS is currently for sale, being auctioned live on, of course, cars and bids. This is a 2016 GT3 RS, and it's finished in this crazy shade of ultraviolet. It also comes with some desirable Porsche equipment, including the PCCBs, PDLS, Sport Chrono Package with white faces, and much more. It also has around 11,000 miles on it. And if you've been in the market for one of these, after you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below where you can head to the live auction of this purple monster where you can bid on it and buy it only on Cars and Bids. We begin the story of the 991.1 GT3 RS by first talking about the very first GT3 RS. Introduced in 2003 and produced from 2003 until 2004, the 996 generation first introduced the nomenclature GT3 RS into the Porsche world. It was a more stripped out, even more focused version of the already excellent GT3. That car was largely built for homologation purposes and it was sold in very limited quantities, so finding one of those is very rare today. But it proved that there was a market for cars like that. People really wanted the GT3 RS, and Porsche decided to follow it up with the next generation, the 997. Produced from 2006 until 2009, the 997.1 GT3 RS was a pretty big deal. It was the first time that the GT3 RS would have over 400 horsepower, courtesy of the Metzger Flat 6. That car proved to be incredibly popular with Porsche enthusiasts, as again, there was a lot of demand for the Dot one GT3 RS, and so Porsche followed it up with a facelifted version called the 997.2 GT3 RS. That car was produced from 2009 until 2011, and again, it was in very high demand. But Porsche wasn't finished with the 997 just yet. Yes, they had facelifted the car and given us two versions of the GT3 RS, but they wanted to go the full distance. They wanted to put a 4-liter flat 6 in the back of the GT3 RS, and in 2011, they gave us exactly that, the limited edition 997.2 GT3 RS 4.0, and it was the thing of dreams. Those cars today are worth an absolute fortune because you get a 4-liter naturally aspirated engine and a manual transmission. It might be the peak of the analog GT3 slash GT3 RS. But in 2011, we didn't necessarily know that. We waited with high anticipation because a new 911 was coming, which meant a whole range of new 911 variants. And then in 2013 at the Geneva Motor Show, Porsche showed off the 991.1 GT3, but it was very controversial. Porsche announced that there would be no manual transmission option. It would be PDK only, and that was that. Enthusiasts were furious. Had Porsche forgotten their way? Had they forgotten about the driving enthusiasts that helped build the brand? Was this an adequate GT3? Well, that controversy carried on to the GT3 RS, because a year later, Porsche would announce the RS variant, and yet again, there would be no manual transmission found in this car. The 911R later on in the 991 cycle would prove that there was a lot of demand for a manual GT3 slash GT3 RS slash Porsche product. And so Porsche would bring back the manual transmission for the GT3 and you can get a manual in a GT3 today. But Porsche has stuck to their guns with the GT3 RS. They claim that this car is focused for track performance and because it's focused just on that, the PDK is the right transmission to go for. And as a result, all modern GT3 RSs since this one have all had PDK transmissions. But enough about the PDK transmission, we'll come back to it later on, but for now I want to focus on this car's design because, as usual, Porsche was fastidious. They began by focusing on reducing this car's weight. They gave this car a magnesium roof, a carbon fiber hood, carbon fiber front fenders, carbon fiber engine cover, and a massive carbon fiber rear wing. And the result is that this car weighed 22 pounds less than the standard 991 GT3, 
meaning this car weighed in at 3,131 pounds, which is very light for a modern day sports car. Porsche would also increase this car's track substantially by 30 millimeters at the front and 80 millimeters at the rear. The whole idea being that they wanted to fit larger wheels and tires to this car, and they did. This car has two 65 section front tires and three 25 section rear tires. An awful lot of mechanical grip, but again, this car is focused on track performance where grip is at a premium. But Porsche wasn't done with the front of this car. Widening the track wasn't enough. No, they wanted to play with the aerodynamics as well, and they did so by adding a front splitter located along the lower part of the front bumper to, well, help split the air. And then they also added these vents located on the fenders to help channel negative air pressure generated by the wheels as they spin out of the car. The result is that Porsche claims this car has 30% more frontal downforce than the 997 GT3 RS that it replaced. And so all of these little elements come together to make a big difference. The aerodynamic tweaks don't end there though. As we come down the side of the GT3 RS, we come to the rear, which has these turbo-like intakes. And they're exactly that, they're intakes for the engine. Normally on the 997 GT3, which can be seen on this GT3 that happens to be in the background, Porsche had intakes located in the deck lid below the rear wing. But in this case, Porsche decided to move them to the side to be a little bit more aerodynamic as they were going with a wider car to fit the wider rubber anyway. And then we come to the wing, this gigantic rear wing. I remember when this car came out, people talked a lot about how huge this thing is and well, it still feels that way. This is a massive rear wing. It's made out of carbon fiber, like I mentioned earlier, for weight reduction, but it's obviously also made to generate downforce, and it generates quite a lot. According to Porsche, at 186 miles an hour, this car generates 485 pounds of rear downforce. The entire car together generates 728 pounds of downforce. And so although this rear wing is ridiculous and huge, it does have a purpose, and it's highly effective. The next thing Porsche focused on was the suspension of this car, as they wanted it to be highly adjustable. At the front, we have a split lower arm setup so that you can dial in some adjustments there. And at the rear, it has a multi-link suspension setup specifically designed to be adjusted. You can make adjustments to the camber, height, and the track, all to dial the car into your liking for the racetrack. It also has three position adjustable sway bars at the front and rear, so you can really set this car up to handle the way you want to, depending on how you're going to use it. This car also has a traditional McPherson strut setup, and it's adjustable on the inside of the car based on how firm you want the ride to be. You will notice that I haven't mentioned that this car has double wishbone suspension, and that's because it doesn't. No GT3 or GT3 RS product had it until the current 992 generation cars. This car was deemed too challenging from a packaging perspective, and so you have a more conventional multi-link setup found in this car. And that's certainly not a dig against this car. Porsche was known for not using the double wishbone setup because for packaging reasons, again, they just couldn't make it work on their cars until the current generation GT3 and GT3 RS. Regardless, this car's suspension has a lot of adjustability that allows you to dial it in exactly the way you want for your driving needs. While I'm in this general region, I want to talk about this car's wheels and this car's brakes as they are impressive. Up front, we have 20 inch wheels and at the rear, 21 inch wheels. And the idea with this is that Porsche, again, wanted to get as much mechanical meat in the form of rubber on the road as possible so that these cars had lots of grip. This particular example also has the optional carbon ceramic brakes, as denoted by the yellow calipers, which really stand out behind these black wheels. Up front, we have six piston calipers and at the rear, four piston calipers, and they're made to carbon ceramic discs measuring 490 millimeters at the front and 410 millimeters at the back. And so this car has a lot of grip to keep you on the road and you have a lot of braking power at your disposal whenever you need it. And now we move to the rear of the 991.1 GT3 RS, the business end as with any 911, and that's because this is where the engine lives. And then you open this huge engine cover with this gigantic wing and you're greeted with two laptop fans, <laughs> at least that's what it looks like. They're just cooling fans and that truly is all you see. This engine is serviceable from underneath and as a result, there's really not a lot of theater or drama to displaying this engine. But I wanted to have the engine cover open to talk about it anyway because it is something special. This car is powered by a four liter naturally aspirated flat six. That's right, Porsche wanted to make sure that just like the previous GT3 RS four liter, they kept a four liter naturally aspirated engine in the new GT3 RS, and it is something special. 
Thanks to upgrades like titanium connecting rods, this engine can rev very high. 8,800 RPM is its red line. Admittedly, this is a little bit lower than the GT3, but it's still very high for a naturally aspirated engine, especially back in 2016. The result is this car produces 500 horsepower and 339 foot-pounds of torque. It can go from 0 to 60 in 3.3 seconds, and it can do from 0 to 100 miles per hour in 7.1 seconds. And so although straight line performance was not necessarily the focus with the GT3 RS, it's all about track handling and finesse, this car certainly has a lot of performance on tap. Another secret to this car's success would be its variable intake system. At low RPMs, it's set to optimize torque to help you get out of a dig. But as you go up the RPM range, another flap opens within it, allowing more airflow into the cylinder, maximizing the amount of power this engine is making. And as a result, this car has a very linear torque curve and a very wide power band, which was Porsche's intent with this particular engine. Very clever stuff, but again, hardly a surprise from a company like Porsche. Another technological development related to this engine would be its motor mounts. That's right, Porsche set its engineers on the motor mounts of this car because, well, standard ones weren't good enough. The solution the engineers came up with were dynamic motor mounts, and the idea is that they're soft in situations that require it. This would be like on bumpy roads and times where maybe you want a little bit more of a refined ride. You want those vibrations absorbed by the motor mounts, and so they can do that. But when you want to drive this car really hard on track situations in particular, they become stiff, meaning that this engine won't rock side to side, which optimizes the handling of this car. And amazingly, Porsche was able to deliver on that. You have both sides of the equation when it comes to these motor mounts. Normally, that's not something exciting to talk about, but it's an incredibly ingenious solution, and it's amazing to see it here in the GT3 RS. The last thing I want to talk about with this engine would be related more to the GT3 than the GT3 RS, as that engine had a tough time early in its life, and that was due to its valve train rocker arms, more commonly known as the finger follower problem. Effectively, there were defects with the metal that Porsche used to make these components, and that could result in increased wear on the engine, and in some cases, fire and or detonation from the engine. Not exactly ideal when you're debuting a new generation of car. But Porsche came up with a fix for it, issued a recall, and gave extended warranties to anybody who brought their cars in and had their engines worked on. However, Porsche was very specific to announce that the GT3 RS was not influenced by this problem. It didn't suffer with the same issue despite having a very similar engine. But some people are confused and think all early 991s, all dot one GT3s and GT3 RSs are affected by this. That doesn't seem to be the case, at least according to Porsche. This engine is very strong, very powerful, and yes, early ones were affected, but it doesn't seem that the GT3 RS was affected by the early finger follower problem. And now we move inside the 991.1 GT3 RS to talk about two things. One is its transmission, and the other is its torque vectoring differential. We're going to start by talking about the transmission. And as I mentioned previously, it was relatively controversial. People really wanted a manual third pedal in their ultimate driver's car, but Porsche cited that this wasn't necessarily the ultimate driver's car, it was the ultimate track driver's car. And this car was built to set lap times. As a result, Porsche gave it its fastest transmission. They couldn't understand why someone would want a more laborious, slower manual transmission. So they said, nine, you get PDK only. And they gave us PDK. And that is what has been in the GT3 RS ever since. No third pedal. Regardless, this transmission is really fast. Porsche claims that it can shift up in as little as 50 to 60 milliseconds and down in something like 90 milliseconds, virtually seamless, effectively. And this car sets amazing lap times. Around the Nürburgring on Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 rubber, this car laid down a 7 minute 20 second lap, which is almost unbelievable for a road car. Effectively, that is what race cars were doing not all that long ago. And so the fact that this car could do it was a testament to how great the chassis and engine and aerodynamics were, but it was also a testament to how capable this transmission was. The last thing I want to talk about with this car's drivetrain would be its torque vectoring rear differential. And this is significant because the car can decide to lock up to 100% of the rear wheels whenever it feels it's necessary. This gives the car a lot of flexibility when it comes to rear traction, and that differential is something special. Coupled together with that amazing engine, this incredibly fast transmission, and all of the other tweaks that Porsche made to this car, it made it quite a driving weapon. 
Unfortunately, we don't get to experience that today. I've come to Arizona to film this car in addition to a couple of others, and, well, unbelievably, it decided to rain. And when I say rain, I mean torrential downpour. It's absolutely a mess out there, and so unfortunately, I can't drive this car today as, well, who wants to see someone drive a car like this slowly in the rain? I want to experience the GT3 RS at its finest, so I'm not going to be driving this car today, but as a consolation prize, I think it's important that you hear the glorious 4-liter flat 6, and so here you go. Here's a sample of this car's wonderful flat 6 engine. And that is the Porsche 991.1 GT3 RS. This car touts excellent performance, wonderful suspension design, a crazy naturally aspirated flat six, and well, it's a GT3 RS. Sure, when it came out, it was controversial because it was exclusively equipped with a PDK transmission, but it doesn't seem to matter as much these days. This car was built by driving enthusiasts for driving enthusiasts. And if you've been in the market for one of these, well, you can buy this one on Cars and Bids. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye.